Welcome in to Locked On Knicks. Alex Wolf here, joined by a very special guest today. I've got Tony East of the Locked On Pacers podcast. Gavin and I, in our last episode, went over some potential trades that the Knicks could look into going into the draft. To get back into the draft, well, the Pacers are a big candidate for that. So I brought Tony in to talk about some scenarios, what the Pacers are up to, what their goals are going into this draft and into this offseason. And then I'm going to toss some mock trades at Tony to end the show. So that's all coming up next on Locked on Knicks. You are Locked on Knicks, your daily New York Knicks podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, welcome in to Locked on Knicks. I want to remind you all, today's show is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app. Create an account and use code Locked On NBA for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. And I want to thank you guys for making Locked On Knicks first listen today and every day. Whether you're checking us out on your favorite podcast platform or taking in the sights and sounds on YouTube, we appreciate you making us part of your daily routine. And if you're not already becoming, <coughs> excuse me, every day or by making sure to hit that auto download function on your favorite podcast app or the notification bell on YouTube. I'm Alex Wolf. I'm Aaron Chief and Nick's like the Strickland, which you can find Strick.land. And as I said, joined by Tony East, the host of Locked On Pacers. Tony, what's up, dude? Uh, I hear your team has five picks in this draft, <laughs> which sounds pretty good to a team with no picks in this draft. Yeah, the opposite situation, right? Pacers were uh, thought to be rebuilding and then, hey, turns out they're kind of decent and might not be rebuilding as fast as they thought or as slow as they thought, whatever the right word would be there. And the Knicks have zero picks and are not at all rebuilding and are very good. But for the context of this conversation, potentially very interesting trade fits just because of the number of picks one team has and the other one does not. Definitely true. And and a certain player that has been linked to the one team via like trade deadline discussions and stuff like that, that we'll get to in a sec. But like I figure before we get into the the you know the real meat, the mock trades and all that stuff, I think it's sort of important to set the table a little bit for Knicks fans to understand. I mean, I I myself would be lying if I said I watched a ton of Pacers basketball or kept up with a ton of Pacers news. So it's good to understand who you hope to go into a trade negotiation with. Uh, So what do you think the Pacers goals are right now as a team going into this offseason? If you were to sort of distill it down. Yeah, big picture. They want to make the playoffs next year, right? And that might sound kind of insane for a team picking seventh overall, but if, if the Pacers will highlight it to you, they would say they were 27 and 22 when both Halbert and Turner played pretty good team, right? The, the Knicks and Pacers had plenty of good battles this past season. Mm-hmm. Uh, although I think did the Knicks sweep them, whatever they were close games. Um, then Halliburton's amazing. It was an all-star at, in his third season. They still have him on a rookie deal. Lots of room to grow. Matherin looks good. He should get better. Uh, they have no bad contracts at all. They have another top 10 pick the blueprint for them being good is just dangling in front of their face, and they haven't made the postseason in three years. They want to make it next year, and they have the resources between their five picks and their cap space to do it. So the question is, how do they do it? Is that trades? Is that signing someone? Whatever that mechanism may be, their goals are to make the playoffs, and for the purpose of the conversation we're about to have, they have said on the record many times, you know, teams will leak this out or beat around the bush sometimes, if they're being vague, no, they're not being vague. The Pacers have said, we cannot make five picks. We don't have the room for that on our team with the goals that we have. So they're going to be making draft trades of some kind because they want to be good next year and they can't bring in five rookies and be good. Well, you know what? That's really funny because I was literally going to be my next question. I was going to say, is there any chance they're going to make all five <laughs> of these picks? Because I that seems unlikely. I it's think so like- funny that I always describe it that same way. Like, you know this, you know, in the media industry, like you'll hear reporters be like, oh, you know, maybe it doesn't really make sense that for them to make five picks like it's not reporters it's their president of basketball operations on the record at least three times being like yeah we can't do it like we just we're just not and some of it is that you know rookies aren't typically good like what christian brown just did in the in the finals is insane because rookies Mm -hmm. are typically terrible in the postseason but it's also like they only have three free agents like they don't even have room on the team to bring in five players right like they just logistically cannot do it you've already seen it reported uh mark stein had some stuff about them potentially moving up and Jake Fisher had some stuff about them moving picks. So we'll talk about later, uh, late in the first round and early in the second round, right? Like because not, not only are they going to be interested in that, they've said it, right? (laughs) They just, they just are. So, you know, if you come with the right offer or 
something like that, the Pacers will certainly be interested because it'll it'll help them meet their goals. And the problem is they're kind of coming from a position of weakness because everybody knows <laughs> that they have to do it, but they, they have to if they want to be better. Yeah, I mean, I guess there's like like benefits and uh, and, and uh, things to like. What's the opposite of a benefit? Uh, <laughs> whatever. I don't know. There, there's good and bad to to laying your cards all on the table. I feel yeah. like, but uh, from their perspective, probably not a terrible idea to just be like, "Hey, open season, start." You know, get these phone lines going like like a radio contest. Like, <laughs> all right, caller ninety seven gets you know. Uh, it gets picked 26 or whatever if you give us a good deal for it. So <laughs> they should um, do it that way. That'd be fun. That would be pretty funny, right? <laughs> it's just like whatever deal comes in. It's like, all right, well, here's a uh, here's three million dollars cash. All right, well, I guess that's it. <laughs> that's what we're gonna do. Um, at any rate, uh, so assuming that they stick it pick seven, I feel like that's probably the most likely pick that they would hold on to. Although, of course, as a Knicks fan, I'm like, oh, I, I like some players in that range. So, I mean, if, they, <laughs> if they'd be willing to talk uh, talk Turkey about a pick seven deal, that would be awesome. But uh, if they're not, you know, I would assume that that's probably the one that they would look to keep. And then maybe the other ones, uh, as a Knicks fan, we've seen them do this, you know, a number of times, the Knicks, uh, where they they sort of, with those late first round picks, early second round picks, it's pretty easy to just sort of kick the can down the road with those picks. And you can find some team that'll give you like some second round picks or like, you know, a protected first in the next year or something like to get a pick in that range. Is there someone that they like pick seven? I feel though, like in this particular draft is, is going to be a pretty solid player that like you're talking about, you know, wanting to win next year, maybe a guy that can come right away and help win next year. So like if they wind up sticking there or at any of their picks, really, like what do you think the Pacers priorities are going into this draft? Yeah, they need fours bad <laughs> really bad rick carlisle said that in his end of season presser and i think you're also right that seven is far and away the most likely pick that they keep both because that's the player most likely to help them this coming season and you know even if they do want to be to be better next year you know halliburton's 23 matherin's 21 like you add in one more just like solid dude to that like even if you fall a little short next year you've got a really good trio even andrew nemar too if you want to throw him in there to grow with and say, okay, even if we are just short next year, we're really ready to hit the ground running two years from now. We're happy with the top 10 pick. Like that one seems like from a timeline perspective and from a success perspective, the most likely one for them to keep. But like, that's what, again, I already said this, they have 12 players under contract. Like what's the 26th pick going to do in that case, right? Like it's, it's hard for that player to even get on the floor. So, you know, there's a lot of interesting things for them to figure out, but uh, if what, with the assets they do have, yeah, they need a forward, right? It's easy to look at their depth. And they have some interesting young guys. Aaron Neesmith had a good year. Duarte was an awesome rookie. Jordan Wara played great for them. But those names are not, you know, starter quality quite yet. Or None of them are really proven playoff performers at this time, right? No one knows what they can be. Maybe they could be great. But they definitely need more production on the wing and at the four, whether that's from the draft or from a trade. And that's definitely what they'll be looking for the most improvement this summer. Well, I, I got some great news for you, Tony, <laughs> and I'm going to bring it up in the next segment. Oh, when boy. We start, when we start getting into some of these some of these mock trades, because it just so happens the Knicks have a guy still on his rookie deal that's a power forward that maybe the Pacers would be interested in. Uh, but real quick, before I get into that, I do just have to remind everybody again, today's show is brought to you by Game Time. And. I tell you what, buying tickets to your favorite events should not be stressful. And I don't know what it's like in your market, Tony, but it's really stressful to buy tickets in New York. They're always really expensive. And if you don't make up your mind months in advance, you're going to probably be paying out the nose. Uh, and it's just not generally a fun experience, especially on resale apps. And that's where game time comes in. They take a lot of the stress out of it. They make the buying process easier. They make it so that you can always make sure that you're going to get the best price. There's a lot of great features at Game Time Features. They have flash deals and last minute tickets, which is great for me. I'm not much of a, a ticket planner. My wife is the planner. I'm the I'm the one who just kind of says, like, eh, I feel like going to a game tomorrow uh, and get tickets. They also make it easy to find and buy tickets for every kind of event in your area, not just sports. Uh, they have images of your seat views and they have a lowest price guarantee, event cancellation protection, job loss protection, and more to help protect you uh, in the event that you're not able to make your event. Uh, and you can get, as I said, exclusive flash deals for all your favorite things, 
including comedy, theater, more uh, concerts, whatever, plus your favorite sports, baseball going on right now. And the game time guarantee means you'll always get the best price. And if you don't get the best price off game time, they'll credit you 110% of the difference. So if you want to get some tickets for yourself, snag the tickets without the stress with game time. Download the game time app, create an account, and use code locked on NBA for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code locked on NBA for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, and we're back in to continue talking about these potential Knicks and Pacers deals, or rather to start talking about the potential deals here. Uh, so, Tony, there is one Obi Toppin on the on the New York Knicks that uh, I didn't I didn't bother going to find the exact article, but at some point over this past trade de- deadline, if I remember correctly was linked to the Pacers uh, as them potentially being interested in him. Uh, it sort of is a perfect fit in theory. I mean, he is a – he's – I think plays a style that would mesh really well with Halliburton, um, also with Miles Turner. So if those are like your two biggest building blocks on the team, um, plus you have Matherin as well. I mean, I just think that there is a great opportunity for a player like an Obi Toppin to be really good – on Indy, I guess I'll before I start getting into trades, probably be good to take your temperature on the guy himself. Uh, have you kept up on Obi at all? Like when there have been little rumors around, did you ever like look into him? Like what what would be your overall thought on bringing Obi Toppin over? Because to me, if the Knicks are going to do business with the Pacers, I think that he makes the most sense as far as the guy that would probably be on the move. I believe it was Sean Devaney from Heavy who had this report uh, late January of this year. I know exactly what you're talking about. If I'm wrong, sorry to Sean, but Sean's a good dude. I think he'll be, uh, he'll forgive me. Um, either way, yeah, here's the thing. Before we even talking about Toppin specifically, we are talking about the Pacers needing forwards, but also Kevin Pritchard as the pe- president of the Pacers. One of his like key things he likes in trades is young guys who are under contract for a long time because in smaller markets, you can't always sign guys, right? It's harder. Mm -hmm. And so Toppin on a rookie deal with years to go and restricted free agency as a backdrop to keep him for longer would be appealing for the team like the Pacers, right? They know they can have at least two years, likely more if he pops and stays with them or they resign him, whatever that could be. So in terms of trade MO of the Pacers past, that makes sense. And from my recollection, correct me if I'm wrong, there was more OB Toppin this year finally at times, but still not as much as Knicks fans want, right? Um, yeah. You can correct me if I'm wrong there. And something that's always been interesting to me is like the shot finally developed a little bit this year, but I always want him to like be more aggressive in the paint and around the rim. And no team is like playing that way anymore where they're just dumping guys the ball inside 15 feet who can't make decisions, which is fine. But, I, you know, he's good. The shot developing definitely matters. Athleticism is great. Like, he's a good player. Uh, but the opportunity hasn't really been there. And there's always, like, a little bit to be desired to me. Uh, correct me if I just said anything stupid. Mm-hmm. So, I think he's a good player. Uh, but I still think there's some some bits and pieces of his game that I would like to know more about. Yeah. So, like, to address some of the stuff. So, first off, I think you are you sort of nailed it a little bit. Like, so... Knicks fans definitely probably would have liked to have seen him more at times this year. Um, I I think actually, as far as his playing time was concerned, it tort- sort of took a step back this year a little bit, unfortunately, because Julius Randle was just so good. I so mean, good, it, yeah. And, and I mean, you know, it's like he was a second team all NBA, so obviously you want him out there for like 35 minutes a game, but you know, that only leaves 13 a game for Obi, and that's what he got a lot of nights um, as a result. So that's not great. He didn't uh, also Randall up until the end of the year didn't miss any time either. So it's not even like, Oh, we got some time to shine. Like last year, Uh, last year, he got like the last like 10 or 11 or something games to like really, really shine because Randall was out Uh, sort of just with like, they just basically shut him down the end of last year and and just let Obi cook. And he was great. Um, I honestly think last year probably would have been the greatest selling point for potentially trading him to a team like the Pacers because like he closed the season looking like, wow, this dude, might be like a 20 point per game player. I still fully believe that. Um, as far as his contract, he actually only has one more year left. So he's he's same as um Halliburton, I believe. So this year is his final year. So it if the Pacers would trade for him at the draft, they would get the opportunity to extend him though before the rookie extension right. deadline uh in the fall, 
which I'm sure would be appealing to them. They would probably want to at least go to the negotiating table. But if they didn't hit that, then yes, he becomes a restricted free agent next year and they can choose to sign him then or match whatever deal comes in, which would be great. As far as his game, I think his three-point shot came around a little bit this year. I think there were times, I mean, even in like the first game against the Heat in the playoffs, he was the only guy on the Knicks that could make a three in that game. Um, the main thing with Obi is, and this is why I think the things would work out really well with Carlisle and with the Pacers, he just needs someone to trust him. Like, that's the biggest issue is like Tibbs never trusted him and would often give him a quick hook. Now, it doesn't help when you have like Julius Randle ready to come back into the game. So like Obi sometimes would be cooking and then would take like one one three that would go awry that he would overthink a little bit, like, you know, like hit the side of the backboard or something. And then a second later, he would be out of the game. And you sort of felt for the guy because you'd be like, man, he's really starting to, he, that was a great stretch of ball for him. He made one mistake at the end and then got yanked, um, which has been a consistent theme with some of the Knicks young players, not just Obi. Like we saw this with uh, Emmanuel quickly and, and uh, Quentin Grimes to a degree in their first couple of years as well. So that's not great, but he, he has made a lot of strides. I think he does enjoy finishing around the rim. He doesn't love to go through contact, but he is like a real contortionist around the rim and does a great job of getting up and under for reverses of, of like somehow like pump faking in the air while he's going in for a layup and like ducking under people and everything else, sort of like a guard would, but like he just has endless hops. So he's great with that. Obviously fantastic in transition and fantastic on alley-oops and backdoor cuts and stuff like that. So yeah, I think he's I think he's got a very like modern skill set. He also you mentioned decision making. I think his decision making is very underrated actually. He's great at making quick decisions on the perimeter and kicking the players whether it's shooting a quick pass inside, kicking it around the perimeter or whatever the case may be. He's really good at that and really good on the short roll and just off quick drive and kick situations as well, which is sort of surprising for a guy of his profile. So, uh I definitely think there's maybe some possibility that that the Pacers would be into that sort of player because it's I mean it fills a position in need and could potentially allow them to condense a couple of draft picks into an experienced NBA veteran who at the NBA level has shown more than what his his like full season stats and playing time and everything might indicate just because of the situation he's been in I think yeah if I zoom all the way out just like as high level as possible. Like he came into the league as like really athletic play finisher. Like that's a great prototype to have. But he added a three this year, right? 60% three point attempt rate, making almost 35% of them. That's encouraging for a guy who mm -hmm. comes in as an athlete, defender, offensive player type to be able to add that to his game. Here's where this gets hard, Alex. Mm -hmm. Correct me if I'm wrong right away. Seven's way too much <laughs> for All Obi right. Toppin straight up. Mm -hmm. uh, 26, not even close to enough. Proby top and straight up. So we're probably mm -hmm. talking multiple picks, right? Is that where you would assume this would go? Yeah. So let me let you know what. Let's take let's take our final little respite here. We're gonna come back and then I'm gonna throw some trades at you. And okay. I'm gonna get your opinion on what you think about some some various deals that could bring Obi Top into the Pacers. And again, I I love Obi Top to death. I hate to keep singling him out, but he's pretty much the only dude I feel like would be the main guy the Pacers would be interested in. So these are all pretty much gonna be very Obi Top and specific. So we'll be right back, and I'm going to pitch some some Obi Toppin trades to Tony. All right, we're back in, continuing talking about Knicks Pacers potential draft deals. The Knicks obviously without a pick in this draft. The Pacers with way too many picks, well on the record as we learned earlier. I I actually didn't know that their that their president of basketball operations was literally like, take my picks, take them, please. I have too many. But not that, not to that I, degree. I, but I, I know, I know. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I'm just exaggerating a little bit. Although I wish that was the case, I'd be like, please. Sign me <laughs> um, so, all right, let's throw, let's throw the first deal out here. So, yes, I do think that just pick 26 for Obi would not necessarily be something the Knicks would be interested in because I think they would be like, no, we spent pick eight on this guy in 2020, and we think he's worth a little more than that. So, what would be your opinion on picks 26 and 29 for Obi Toppin? Do you think Absolutely. that would get? I was a assuming that's what scoff. your offer was going to be. Yes. Which is probably means it's good, right? When I was like, oh, what would the Obi trade be? Uh, can we just do 32 instead of 29 just because of the rookie scale deal fart part? I just said rookie scale deal fart. Nice. There we go. <laughs> <Good podcast>. hey. <laughs> <laughs> if we, I just, you know, 32 is basically a first. But I just yeah. think the Pacers would like to have the rookie scale deal 
I mean, why I, not? I mean, sure. If it if it comes down to it, we're negotiating picks that are three picks apart, whatever. But yeah. I I do think that two of those three would be close to value. That makes sense mm -hmm. for the Pacers, right? For a young guy under contract right now with restricted free agency to guarantee at least some form of keeping him. And you know what? What twenty six? The chance that that player is as helpful as Toppin for the Pacers is low, I would say. So mm -hmm. yeah, I, I think I would do that. Um, but. It, it depends who's available, but you can never know that. And it's so far into the draft that like, you know, you're running stupid risks. So, yeah, um, yeah I think I think I would do that as the Pacers. Uh, I would definitely at least think hard about it because of their positional needs, certainly. And uh, he's better than Jordan Wara, uh, to me at least. I would rather bet on that upside, certainly. Um, Duarte and Neesmith have had their moments, but yeah, Toppin could certainly supersede them at times too. And they're both more guardy than forwardy. So, yeah, I think I would do that, but I'd have to think hard about it. You know, I didn't even ask, how do the, uh, how do you think, things are going with Duarte because I know that was a guy that the Knicks were Knicks interested him, in the yeah. draft. Yeah. You well, know, he had such a good first year and such a terrible mm -hmm. second year that it's really hard to say. And, you know, his second season was so weird because the change, he's so much better than like a slow paced style and the Pacers are their, their best playing extremely fast with Tyrese Halburn on their team. So mm -hmm. every chance he had to kind of grow chemistry and fit in, he'd get hurt. Like he had a 30 point game. It was his best game of the season. And then, twisted his ankle and missed six weeks like the next game and then he came back from that and was finally having a good stretch and then hey look his ankle hurts again like it just mm -hmm. never connected for him this season so on one hand yeah it was a bad season like he'll, he'll tell you that but it, on the other hand he had no chance to kind of adjust and adapt and mm -hmm. be the Chris Duarte he was his rookie but he had a bad year right it, it, there's no way to sugarcoat it so it's kind of hard for me to figure out his trade value when he was a good rookie and all these teams wanted him, but then it was a bad second year player. And he's also pretty old for a second year player. Like it's kind of hard for me to figure out what his value is right now. I mean, Obi's pretty old for a, for a third year player as well. They, they, they sort of came in. Right? Yeah. 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 They sort of came in under very similar circumstances in the NBA is very old rookies. Um, I can tell you from, from the Knicks perspective, like I think this is the real world Knicks. I don't know if I'm totally sold on Duarte, if I'm being completely honest, but like, from their perspective, I feel like they would probably come to the Pacers with a deal and be like, would you give us like 26 and Duarte and maybe try to like finagle pick 55 for for Toppin or something like that? And I don't even know if the if that would be something that the Pacers would be into, but it would certainly fill more of a position of need for them. And I feel like for the Knicks, it would just do. I think the Knicks goal at this point is just to add more or at least i think it should be add more rookie scale contracts right. to sort of future the new cba means every team's going to want to do that right exactly like, important. Yeah. yeah yeah so and uh, especially because you don't want to like with the knicks specifically like for the pacers if you get ob top and then you offer him a deal and you pay him like 13 million a year or something on his second deal that's palatable because he's going to start for you. You know what I mean? And that's like a relatively low contract by the terms of the new CBA. But if you're the Knicks and you offer in that same deal, it's like, are we really going to pay this dude 13 million to play? We're going to play him a, a, a million per minute per game to back up Julius Randle. And that's just like not great for a guy that would just end up being a backup effectively. Can, um, can I? Th so here to the Duarte part specifically, mm -hmm. I personally would value Duarte over all three of their. 26 29 32 mm -hmm. picks myself one because his rookie season was good but two because they've made decisions with him in mind for years mm -hmm. since they picked him so that he has more value to them than something that is not on their team at the mm -hmm. moment mm -hmm. so i think i prefer the first package to that my counter thing to discuss too would be i haven't looked at the next cap sheet yet but like mm -hmm. is cap really something that would be important to them because the Pacers can afford to take in Evan Fournier without sending back any matching salary, but then the draft pick compensation becomes worse and the Knicks might not be interested in that. Yeah. The, the Knicks are in this position where they don't necessarily need uh, like space because yeah, I wouldn't think so. The, would. They're going to end up where they, they don't, they won't have enough space no matter what to sign anybody of substance. So right. like, I think their only concern right now is probably going to be staying under the tax line and giving Josh Hart his, his new contract. Cause they're, they're definitely going to try to resign Hart. I honestly would be surprised if it goes past the first day of free agency and they just say, we resign yeah, Josh yeah. Hart. That's it. Right. Um, June 30th. That doesn't even make it to July. <laughs> exactly. Like it'll, it'll be before midnight. You know what right. I mean? Like it opens at six. It'll be done at six 15. It'll be one right. of those deals. So uh, dude, it's done. I mean, it's done now. <laughs> it's probably <laughs> already done. If we're being honest. Yeah. Um, so I think that's just how their free agency is going to go. I don't think they're going to have any sense of urgency to move Fournier, 
unless they see some sort of move. Like, I actually think they're going to just keep Fournier and just be like, let's just keep this $18 million chunk of salary around in case we get an opportunity to make yeah, a big splash sense. or something. That's right. Um, Never mind. But we'll, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see what <laughs> happens there. I want to throw something else to you, though. I'm kind of intrigued by this. Like, Ooh. so Gavin and I, especially me, I have a player that I very much love in the top 10 that's probably going to be in the Pacers range. And that's Taylor Hendricks, who's probably a guy that you've looked into quite a bit, too. Yeah. Because he probably yeah. fits with the Pacers one as well. Oh, great player. But would be a guy that I would love, especially given the situation the Knicks are in where they could bring him along slowly as a 10 to 12 minute per game player behind Julius Randle at first. That would appeal to me greatly because I think he he looks awesome. I think that he could finally be the four or five that would make Tibbs maybe go small uh, because he has some rim protection ability and can shoot the ball. So I know you had said like seven, probably too much for Obi Toppin. I totally agree there. The Knicks are, however, in possession of like four protected first round picks going forward. And I, I know the Pacers, if they're looking to build things out on their roster, probably – the, oh, the, the avenue is always going to be trades. You know what I mean? So I can I can lay out the picks the Knicks have for you real quick. I have them all memory. I was about to look it up. I need to see the protections more so than the picks specifically. Yes. So they have they have <laughs> Milwaukee's 2025 pick protected top four. Uh, and then I think that also that like protects top four like another couple years after that or something. Um, they have Dallas's pick, which protects top 10 next year yeah, and the year after, yeah. then conveys his two seconds. They have a Washington pick that scales down in protection like every year from like top 18 down to like by the time it's finally done like top eight or something and like three years from now it's like that one goes a while because like 2025 2026 uh and then a similar pick from detroit where it's protected lottery for a number of years and then gradually goes down until hopefully when kate cunningham and some of the guys on detroit mature up a bit and they finally become good enough like it'll convey as like probably a, a late lottery or like early teen, early mid teens pick, something like that. Uh, so they have that's what they have. They have four extra first round picks plus all their own first round picks. So nice. I, I guess I, I guess the, I got yeah. the list up. I, I this okay. Nick this uh, this Bucks one confuses me. So if yeah. it's one through four, it goes to New Orleans, and yeah. then the other. That's so weird. Okay, it's it's a bizarre arrangement. Yeah, the way yeah. That that's the that's the reason up. I paused for an unnatural amount of time there. Sorry, yeah. to your listeners. <laughs> takes a minute. Takes a minute. Yeah, that was something. That about. Real GM was like, "Hey, dummy, read this." Um, <laughs> so the reason there there's uh, the reason I'm pausing and stalling by using many words is the best any of those can be is that Bucks one in two years, mm -hmm. and none of them can be higher than nine. Mm -hmm. I think to looking at them. Or so eight. Or yeah, I guess nine because they're top eight. I protected. think, yeah. yeah. So the Bucks one probably won't be good, but the Pistons one could be okay. And the Wizards one, man, that one could be. That one's hard to say because, I mean, we're talking one day after this Beal stuff. So mm -hmm. it's hard to say what they'll look like in a year. So, I mean, for all, all of them, maybe, maybe? I don't. It's I don't think I don't think all of them would be on the table. I think if it was the Knicks and Leon Rose, they would be like Obi Toppin and like take your pick of two of those picks. Oh, only two? Yeah, I wouldn't do that. Yeah, I wouldn't do that. Yeah, I guess we'd have to see. It's a what, it, ah man. What are the best two of these? That's the hard part too. Is what are the best two of them? Yeah, it's tough. Probably to pick. Wizards Pistons. I would guess. Yeah, mm -hmm. I kind of worry. I kind of wonder about the Mavericks one too. Like, I don't think the Mavericks are going to just magically turn it around next year. So I think that could be a mid first again. Um, does anyone know what Kyrie's gonna do? Does Kyrie know what Kyrie's gonna do? Does does Kyrie going back there even guarantee even help them be better? Yeah, sure. like they didn't ex didn't exactly work this year, so I don't know. I so that that's yeah, that's something to consider. But that sounds like it's it's probably a little less likely, which yeah, I figured was the I, answer. I would love for that to be likely, though. That would make my life so happy. I don't. I think that if you're if the Pacers' goal would be to not need to rely on the draft after this year. Yeah. It's the only reason I'm like, eh, I don't know about that. Like value wise in a vacuum, maybe this makes sense, but I don't think from where the Pacers are trying to go, they'd be interested in this. See, see, from my perspective, the way that this pans out to me is that if I were looking at this and I was trying to sell this as Leon Rose to the Pacers, I would be like, look, be let's be real here. Like the way the Pacers get like an influx of talent is either the draft or a trade. Like there's right. not typically free agents lining up to sign there. Not that the Knicks have much room to talk other than Jalen Brunson over the last however many years, but like, you know, it's, it's not typically like a free agent destination that guys are going to is like a plan right. a or even B sometimes. Uh, so 
my pitch then would be, hey, now you're in sort of a similar position to where the Knicks are right now, where you've got a nice collection of young talent. You've got a few extra picks to mess with. You kind of turn your one pick this year, and then they could potentially trade another one of those, you know, pick 26, pick 29, something like that for another protected first round pick or something. Now suddenly you've got that like little mini treasure trove that you can use to potentially get a, a guy out there that becomes available for trade that has some years left on his contract that you can really, you know, play with and, and, you know, hopefully build something with sort of similar to like what they did with like Oladipo in a way with the way that, that they got him and when they got him uh, and he played really well for them for a bit. So that would kind of be my selling point there to be like, well, this team always seems like they're ready to just plug and play someone. And you have Rick Carlisle, who's such a good coach. Like that would seem like a pretty good move to me. You know what I like about all these picks hmm. is none of them belong to the Pacers. So they'd be good for a star trade package. And mm-hmm. that's kind of what I feel like the Knicks point of getting them was correct. Exactly. me if I'm wrong. Oh, for sure. For yeah. sure. Cause then you could trade all your own and these, right? Which exactly. is part of the good appeal. Mm-hmm. So if the, that's where I would want them as the Pacers more so than actually making the picks. That's what like, I'm saying. That's my whole you know, self. Halliburton, he's great. Yeah. Let's throw the wh- whoever becomes, a, you never know in the NBA, but mm-hmm. you know, whoever's available, throw the bag at that guy. That would be the reason I would consider it, but I would mm-hmm. need more than two of them. <laughs> I would definitely yeah. need more than two of them. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe it turns into three. It would depend on who the Knicks would be interested in. I got one last trade to throw at you, though. This one is so simple. It's this one's literally just going to be like, yeah, probably they would do this. Cash. <laughs> it's just cash, man. 55? For cash considerations, rather 55 or maybe even 32. Stranger things have happened. Picks in the early 30s have gone for cash. Listen, listen, years. listen. I think, I think if you're a fan of a team and they sell their second rounder, you should be pissed as a fan, right? They just... Yeah. Threw the acid away. Oh, I always feel that way too. And yet it happens. Wizard, I think the, my favorite Wizards, man. They've done it yeah. all the time. It's killer. It's I stupid. think the Knicks did it themselves a couple years ago, if I remember yeah. correctly. Oh, they, well, um, well, but to address the trade, though, the Pacers yeah. did it last year. <laughs> they yeah. sold pick 58 to the Bucks. So uh, not unheard of in their current tenure. And I mean, they can't make five picks. So yeah. <laughs> I mean, if that's the best offer you get for 55, you might as well do it. Sick. Well, money's money. So I'll, I'll do that. That's fine. Hey, I think we made some good progress here, though. We should uh, send a recording of there this. There are to, some uh, natural fits, I think, there. for something to happen between these two teams. Yes, I think so, too. So. All right. Well, I think that's as good a note as any to to end this pod on. Tony, thanks so much for popping on, dude, and and taking the time and talking this out with me. This is this is one that Gavin and I have wanted to talk more in depth about. So I was glad to get you on and and get to uh, chop it up about this a little bit. Uh, do you have anything you want to like plug work wise uh, on locked on Pacers or anything else you're doing now before the draft? Yeah, we're diving into the prospects because I just had Taylor Hendricks yesterday. So perfect. Oh, timing. sick. Perfect timing. <laughs> so, so if anyone wants to learn about him and yeah. fantasize like me, then you can go check, it, check out Tony's. Podcast. I'm actually amazed, Alex, at this episode because you we've talked trades a lot just because mm-hmm. of the directions of our team for the last three years. We didn't say Miles Turner's name once for the first time ever. It's a miracle. Yeah. It, <laughs> normally, that's always who we're, we're here to talk about. It's crazy. So it's a miracle. Yeah. The, check out Locked on Pacers if you want more on the Pacers. But glad to be here. Glad to talk about the Knicks. I was just in New York for five days. It's fun to to be a part of the buzz for sick. a little bit. Sick. Well, it's it's a great city. It's a great city. Took I'm actually going to be in Indianapolis. MSG, I felt so official. It was I'm going to be in Indianapolis this weekend. How weird is wow, that? Wow, look yeah. at us. Yeah, city so pump. strange. So <laughs> look at that. Anyway, all right. Well, if if you guys enjoyed this, make sure to check out some of Tony's work, especially some of the draft stuff. We've been a little lighter on the draft covers <laughs> this year since we don't have much to talk about. So definitely check out that if you want to if you want to hear about some of the top prospects but thank you all for listening and uh be sure to tune in i think gavin's having howard beck on tomorrow to talk about the knicks and maybe he'll throw some hypothetical trades at howard beck i don't know (laughs) he's gonna talk to him about something so that's coming up tomorrow but till then thank you all for listening and we'll talk to y'all soon peace out everybody